I will first give you a brief introduction about exoplanets, about how they were discovered, which is the classification that we use nowadays, and which are the detection methods that we, we use in, in exoplanets, but particularly for detecting hot Jupiters. Then we are going to go into the details of hot Jupiters. We are going to look for the, um, the properties, the different information channels that we have in mind nowadays. Uh, we are going to, to look at the global circulation models. And finally, to the inflated radii, which is one of the properties that we want to, to study. And finally, we are going to do some, uh, we are going to have a look at the, at the omic dissipation, which is one of the possible uh, explanations for this inflated radii of, of hot Jupiters. So let's start. Um, let's start with these exoplanets. As you know, exoplanets are all these planets which are outside the solar system. Um, however, it was not until the 90s when the first uh, exoplanet was confirmed. The first exoplanet, in fact, it was a, a three system exoplanet of, of three terrestrial mass planets, which was orbiting around a, a pulsar. But from this first confirmed detection, there has been a lot of discoveries, a lot of discoveries, and thanks to different missions such as Hubbard, Spitzer, Kepler, Gaia, and, and all of them that, that you can observe here. And this huge amount of technology that has participated in, in, the, in the detection of exoplanets have, um, have, have allowed us to, to confirm up to the date more than 5,000 exoplanets. So, however, uh, most of these exoplanets are not everywhere. Well, the, 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 the planets that are detected are, are not everywhere, but they are in the, in the Milky Way. They are in a, in a small region of the Milky Way. So, because, because we don't have enough technology nowadays to, to check and to, to verify, to confirm planets further away from from our, our, our galaxy. The closest exoplanets that we have seen so far, we have confirmed so far, is the one which is in the, in the closest star, which is Proxima Centauri B. And I want to mention that there is a difference between a candidate and a, and a confirmed exoplanet. So we have a candidate when we have a planet that has been observed, but uh, it has been observed just about one telescope, so maybe sometimes some of these candidates, as they have been detected by um, indirect methods or techniques, they are not really exoplanets, so they can be uh, false positives. So in order to confirm that an exoplanet is an exoplanet, we need to verify with two more observations, with two more telescopes, the, the presence of the, of the planet. So nowadays, due to this, this kind of criteria that we have to, to confirm exoplanets, thousands of exoplanets are candidates and have not been confirmed yet. So we said that there are more than 5,000 exoplanets known so far. However, we expect and we know that there are differences among them. So one of the classification that we have in order to to see the differences is between is among the, the mass. So according to this specification, we have terrestrial planets which have masses from 0 0.5 to 2 Earth masses. Then we have super Earths from 2 to 10 Earth masses, Neptune-like planets from 10 to 20 Earth mass uh, Earth masses, and then gas giants from 50 to 4,000 Earth masses. So basically, in the solar system, we have Terrestrial planets, Neptune line, uh, gas giants, but we don't have any kind of super Earth, um, super Earth like, like planets. But I'm not studying all of them. I'm just studying gas giants. So we are going to go into the detail of these gas giants. So basically, gas giants are those planets which have a similar size to, to Jupiter and to Saturn. Up to the date, we have discovered and confirmed more than 1,600. And they are characterized by not having defined surfaces, but they have gas around a solid core. So they are mainly formed by uh, hydrogen and, and helium. And they are characterized by having a fast formation 
uh, mechanisms of, of the formation of the of the planet. So one of the possible classifications <laughs> of these gas giants as they have they are more than 1,600. One of the possibilities is to classify them by the the appearance and the <laughs> materials that we can find in the in the atmosphere. So we can find some of these gas giants which have ammonia clouds, some other have water clouds, some others might not have clouds, some others have alkali metal clouds, and some others have silicate clouds. But uh, I'm not interested in all these gas giants, so I'm just interested in one group which have a particular characteristic of, of gas giants, which are hot Jupiters. Hot Jupiters are gas giants but have the peculiarity that they orbit really close to the host star. So this will give this kind of exoplanets uh, 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 a characteristic and a, and a different behavior to, to study and, and some, some properties that we'll see, we'll see later. So before going to these hot Jupiters, I just want to mention the different detection methods that we have nowadays, the most important ones or the most used, which are um, these that we have here. We can classify these techniques in two big groups, the direct techniques, which consist on direct imaging. However, this is not really usual. This is not of the most common methods. And then we have indirect techniques, which in which we can find transit, radial velocity, gravitational microlensing, and, and astrology. So in this plot, you can observe more or less the percentage of, um, of use of each, of each technique according to the number of exoplanets that have been discovered in using different techniques. So for example, 75% 70, 70, uh, of the exoplanets known so far have been detected by, by transit. Then we have radial velocity, direct, imaging, microlensing, and, and astronomy. So I'm just going to talk about transits and radial velocity. So just to, to understand a little bit how a transit works, this is a very simplified version, but we have a star, we have a light curve. So basically when a planet goes in front of the, the star, the amount of light that we receive from the, from the star decreases. So this can give us information that there, there is a, an exoplanet. But apart from that, it can also give us information about the characteristics of the, of the exoplanet. It can tell us, for example, the, um, according to the amount of light that is covered, it can give us information of the of the, of the exoplanet, if we know the, 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 how the star is. But it can also give us information, for example, about the separation between the, the star and the planet. Or if we go into the detail, we can also infer information about the, the composition. And then we have another uh, method which is really used in, in, in order to detect hot Jupiters, which is the radial velocity. So, yeah. Here, um, in order to detect planets, we use the gravitational effect that the planet has on the star. So we know that the planets orbit around the star because of the gravitation of the star on the planet, but the planet also makes an effect on this star. So this star, as you can see here, moves back and forwards, and we, okay, moves back and forward, and we can appreciate from here this effect thanks to the light that we receive from the star. So we can see this movement thanks to the Doppler effect. So if the lights, if the lines of, of light move to the red or to the blue, it means that there is this movement in the star. So we can we can detect the presence of a of a, of an exoplanet. And this kind of, of technique can give us information about the mass of the of the planet. So Let's go now to talk about hot Jupiters. So as we mentioned before, hot Jupiters are gas giants which orbit really close to their host star. If, to give you some numbers, they, they are that close that the average of 
of a period around the star is three days. So if you compare to Mercury, that Mercury, uh, the transition, the um, translation around the, the star takes 80, 88 days. It's, they are really, really, really close within one, 0 0.1 astronomical units. So due to this proximity, they are tidally locked. So there is one of the sites that always face the star and the other, which has not has has um, okay. There is this day side which always stays the star, and, and the other part which is the night side that doesn't receive directly the, the light from the from the star. I don't know why it's darker. The switch. You go to the next slide. Okay. Can you see it well or? Yes, we Yeah. Okay. No, because the, the brightness is maximum. So. Okay, so okay, let's go. Let's go ahead. So I mentioned that they are tidally locked. Uh, we don't have hot Jupiters in the solar system because we don't have any planet which is closer to, to Venus with these kind of characteristics. And uh, up to now, we have more than four hundred confirmed hot Jupiters. But here, I have to mention that there is a bias in favor because these planets are big, so they are massive, so they have. Um, they are easy to detect thanks to the thanks to the um, the radial velocity. And on the other hand, as they are close to the star, this transit meto, uh, transit uh, technique use um, also also is is quite common to to detect the, the presence of these of these hot Jupiters. So the first hot Jupiter was detected in 1995 by Mayor and, and Kelo, in, it was Pegasi B, 51 Pegasi B. 51 Pegasi B is a Jupiter-like planet, particularly, as we mentioned, a hot Jupiter, which has a four-day orbit and orbits around the sun-like star. So just to let you know, here you have the, the conversion between um, Jupiter and Pegasi B and our, our star sun and, and 51 Pegasi. Um, however, after this first discovery, there were more additional exoplanets with similar characteristics that could also be uh, hot Jupiters. And this, at this moment, it was when the term hot Jupiter appeared for the, for the first time. So after these first discoveries in the, in the 2000, um, with the discovery of, of this exoplanet, Thanks to the transit method, it started a new era because uh, thanks to the bit radial velocity and the transits, a lot of, of more hot Jupiters were, were detected and confirmed uh, until, until today. So one of the main questions that we have when we are talking about hot Jupiters is this proximity and, this, and the origin of themselves. So, they were created. One of the questions is, are they created close to the star or were they created far and then they migrated to the proximity of the star? So we don't know. There are some evidences for different from these three different mechanisms that we will see later. But in order to answer this question, one of the things that we can do is try to study some of these hot Jupiters, which are young. So one of the most interesting hot Jupiters known so far than Kevin that can help us to answer this question is uh, HIP 67522b. It was discovered in June 2020 and it's characterized by having a, a seven day orbit. So the peculiarity that has this planet is that um, it's just a few million years old. So study the properties of this planet can help us to answer which was the the 
formation channel that he that he has. So let's check which are these three different formation channels that that we are we are considering. So the first of them is in situ formation. For in situ formation, we think we consider that the planet was created near the star. However, this mechanism is difficult to explain because the, um, the formation uh, at the beginning of the of the formation of the planetary system in such an um, uh, an intense environment is difficult because, for example, the heat from the start would disperse all the materials and would um, would vaporize most of the of the particles that were around. So it's one of the possibilities, but it can be difficult. And then we have a second mechanism, which is dismigration. In the dismigration, uh, we consider that the planet was formed, was created uh, far from the star, but then the planet moved through the through the planetary disk and stayed near the, the star. Uh, and the third mechanism that we have is a similar to the dismigration, but after the dissipation of the dismigration. So in this third mechanism, the gas disk that surrounds the star dissipates, and then by uh, a distortion of the orbit of the um, of the hot Jupiter, it migrates to the to the vicinities of the of the star. So these are the three different mechanisms that we have. There are evidences for the three of them, but there is no answer um, for yeah for the for the origin itself. So more more studies are are needed in this in this in this topic. So regarding the atmospheres in hot Jupiters, as we mentioned, hot Jupiters are really close to the star, so they are um, violent or intense. They have intense environments, which unique thermal, chemical, and dynamic conditions. So one of the main characteristics of these atmospheres in hot Jupiters is that they have really fast winds, which can achieve the speed of sound because of the high intensity of the of the irradiation that we receive from the from the star. So uh, nowadays we know that these atmospheres of hot Jupiters um, can have carbon, can have nitrogen, can have uh, oxygen, sodium, potassium, and can also have some refractory clouds that at the temperatures of hot Jupiters, which are mm -hmm. higher than 1000 Kelvin, uh, they are made basically of silicates and, and iron. But one of the main questions and the and one of the things that is most studied regarding the, the atmosphere and the circulation models is how all this fluid in the atmosphere moves. So this is or this is known as the global circulation models. These global circulation models study this movement of the of the fluid, uh, taking into account the radiative uh, transfer models of the of the um, of the yeah of the radiation itself. No, so it should take into account both the absorption and the and the emission of the of the stellar uh, flux that will depend on the wavelength and on the depth of the deposition of the of the irradiation so this is one of the most complex problems known nowadays in 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 hot jupiters that has been simulated in one G and one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, but they have uh, different approaches. So there are, in principle, two main approaches. One, which studies the simulation using meteorological equations. So these are Navier Stokes equations, but are simplified, and they consider thin atmospheres with locally hydrostatic fluid, but then there are there is another approach with our non-hydrostatic equations, uh, also with Navier Stokes or, or Euler. But in this case, these non-hydrostatic are uh, capable of capture this propagation of the sound waves, which are really important in hot Jupiters because the, the winds can achieve the, the velocity of, of sound. So 
these are two different two different approaches. So one important thing. So okay. So from these global circulation models, uh, what we can see. So we can observe some plots like this one. In this plot, we can we can see like a, a slice of the of the overall of the of the of the plant, the longitude and the and the latitude, and then the color bar corresponds to the to the temperature. And basically, we can observe that there is a high contrast in the day side and night side in talking so regarding the the temperature. So this contrast is due to the due to the high radiation that the planet receives from the from the star. Moreover, this maybe you cannot see from there, but there are some small arrows. These arrows are due to the the winds well are the winds created by this irradiation from the star. But if you see the maximum in temperature is not in in the in this zero zero, but it's a little bit moved to the to the day side of the of the planet. So basically um yeah basically we we observe the high different contrast in, in temperatures and this wind profile going going. So these mechanisms and these models are not perfect. So some things can be can be improved. So for example, some of the things that can be included in food in future models of global circulation models are taking into consideration, for example, how the clouds are formed in the in the atmospheres or also considering, apart from the hydrodynamics, considering also the magneto hydrodynamics, and uh, also consider how the layers move up and, and down. So these models are still uh, in, in research, but the fact is that uh, global circulation models are not studied just from, an, from a, a simulation or theoretical point of view, but they are also studied from, a, from an observational point of view. So from observations and from transit and, and, and data and data inferred from these transits, they have seen in, in paper 2018 that there exists this difference in temperature between the day side and the night side and these winds in the in the atmosphere. Okay, so let's talk now about the last property and one of the most important properties that is the one in which we are interested, <coughs> which will be the ready. So we know that due to this proximity to this star, hot Jupiters have high temperatures. So Temperatures about 1,000 Kelvin. So these temperatures are due to the high radiation that re they receive from the star. So to put you a little bit of numbers, they receive more than 10,000 times the radiation that Jupiter receives from our sun. So it's an intense environment. So this consequently will create a different structure and a different and it's different composition. So one of the properties that we are interested in is the ready. So in this plot, you have the equilibrium temperature of the planet and the planet radius. Each dot is a hot Jupiter observed. And we have this red line, which corresponds to what we expect of which ready we expect for different temperatures, taking only into account the irradiation from the star. So as you can see, most of the planets are above this line. So they have a higher ready than we expected. So it means that we need another source apart from the irradiation of the star that can explain us why they are in place. So this is what we are studying. We are studying one of the possible mechanisms that that could answer this, this question. So 
although we are just studying one of the mechanisms, there are tens of mechanisms which can be classified in two different groups. The first group consists on a, on a reduction of the internal cooling. So at the beginning, the planet is, is hotter. So if we improve the opacity of the planet, we will not lose as much energy. So this energy could be used to inflate the planet. And then we have a, a second group, a second category, which consists on the internal deposition of, of heat in the, in, the, in the interior due to dissipation mechanisms, for example. There are a lot of mechanisms, but the one in which we are working is omic dissipation. So in omic dissipation, but in all these internal deposition mechanisms, what is important is um, the amount of energy and the depth in which this energy is deposited. So now we are going to talk about this, this omic dissipation, which is the me mechanism that we are studying. So omic dissipation can be studied from two different points of view, from the atmospheric or from the deposition of this energy in the atmospheric region or in the internal region, in, the, in a deeper region in the, in the planet. So hot Jupiters have high temperatures. These high temperatures ionize some materials such as sodium and potassium. And these particles, <laughs> are in movement because there is a strong wind due to the high different temperature that we mentioned before. So these strong winds coupled with the internal magnetic field that there is in, in, the, in the hot Jupiters induce forces that dissipate, that the movement of these currents dissipate energy and this energy could be a possible mechanism to explain this inflated radiation. So in this case, this uh, deposition of the energy would be at atmospheric level. But the omic dissipation can also, can also happen in the, in, the internal, in the internal region. So if you observe this, this image, this would be like the outer region. And then we have this pin region. This pin region will be when the dynamo of the planet will occur. So when the the magnetic field is constantly regenerating. So there we can have also a, a movement of the fluid, which is charge, and this movement of the fluid charge will create also a, a dissipation, so a energy that will inflate the planet, not from the outside, but from the, from the inside. Okay, so, Yes, here I just forget about this, this plot. This plot is important because it can give us information about the different uh, conductivity profiles. So when we are in the atmosphere, um, one of the things that we have to take into account is these particles that I ionize, how much they conduct. So from, from some profiles, the study that from, from, from uh, conductivity profile is tight as this one from the Dietrich. We can we can infer these conductivity profiles that later we will use them in the in the simulations. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an overview of the of the research that we are doing. So we have two different projects. The first project is focused on MHD atmospheric simulations. So if you remember, we had this image before about the, the whole planet. And, and the idea is to select of this whole planet one box of a local region and to simulate how these fast winds uh, happen, how they change the, the movement, and basically focusing on two different things. So study how uh, this atmospheric turbulence affect on the magnetic field and also on the omic dissipation. So this is basically the aim of the of the project. So there are previous studies which did uh, this kind of simulations, but not in 3D, but in, in 2D. And they also did these simulations taking into account just the hydrodynamical part the magnetic fault. 
part. So now we are going to include this magnetic hydrodynamic to, to evolve and to see how, how it changes. So the, the final aim of the, of the project is to check when these turbulences are created in the atmosphere and then quantify if the currents created in these boxes are enough to, when they are dissipated, inflate the, the, the hot Jupiter. So we are doing simulations in 2D, in 2D and 3D, and they are small regions of the day site. And these regions, if you are taking into account the, the scale, they are from 0 0.01 bars to 10 bars. So it's basically the upper part of the, of the atmosphere. So how do we do this, this simulation? So basically we are using Simpluni. Simpluni is a cloud-based environment, which is, which is open. And it's used for scientific dynamic uh, models. And it's really used to, to, it's really easy to use because you have a problem, you have a model, and you have a policy. Then you put in the model your physical loads, you put in the problem your <coughs> conditions, initial conditions, control conditions, etc., and you put in the policy the kind of discretization that you want to use in the problem. And from this, it creates a code which you can compile it and then run and check what happens in your in your box. So this is just the browser. Here you have all your problems, your models, your policies, and you can select them. Like a, it's really friendly user. Okay, so we mentioned that we have the problem, the model, and the policy. So in the model, we put our equations. Here we say that they are MHD. So we have continuity, momentum, induction, and energy, and energy equations, which are related with the with um, with the energy variable, and then with uh, an equation of a state. We are considering the, the ideal gas equation of the state to close all the system of, of equations. We evolve them and we check how the different fields change in, in time. On the other hand, we have the problem. In the problem, we are considering a constant background temperature because in the regions we are, we are when we are studying, it doesn't change significantly, so it's constant. And the box that we are using, it's a 0, 0,5 box in 2D and 0L in, in the third dimension. And we have a physical region and a damping region. So basically, <clears throat> here, what you can see is how we see this box from our visualization tool. So from this region up, up it will be a damping region. And from this region down, it will be the physical region. So the physical region is the region of interest for our research. It's where we will study the different variables and the different fields and check how they change. And the damping zone is a non-physical region which has the objective to observe, uh, to absorb all the possible energy that escapes from the, from the physical region. So this is more or less how we, how we observe these this box from, from a 2D slice. And regarding the boundary conditions, we have X and in, in, in X and Y, we have periodic conditions. And in Z, the conditions are a little bit more difficult, but the, the main aim is that they have to ensure hydrostatic stability of the, of the static background, and then uh, let that the upwards perturbation propagate in order to absorb them. So this is basically what the Z condition should, should ensure. So some other relevant, uh, relevant points of the, of the simulation is that we have a forcing. So we have the MHD equation. We, have putting a, we are putting a forcing, which corresponds to these winds uh, generated by the, the gradient of temperature between the day side and the night side, but we are also uh, introducing some small perturbations in the atmosphere to give 
heterogeneity and to check if they have any effect on this change of the of the magnetic field. <laughs> then we have also a Newtonian cooling. This Newtonian cooling is um, there in order to prevent that locally the temperature achieves high values. So if it achieves high values, the, our simulation can can crash. And on the other hand, I just want to mention to you that we are considering a, a background perturbation approach. So our variables have been divided. Uh, we have a, a background component and then a, a perturbed component. So we evolve the perturbed component and we give still the, the, the background. <laughs> yes. Regarding the forcing, uh, I want to let you know that we are not using a random forcing, but we are using forcing that is inferred from these global circulation models that we checked before. So, uh, for example, the Rogers in 2014 inferred these different profiles that you can observe here. Or in our case, it will go from 10 to 0 0.01. So we are considering this region as a as a the main component of the forcing of the of the signature. So we are still working in this simulation, so we don't have final results. But here you can observe one of the components in which we are interested, which is the, the density of the fluid. So first, one of the things that mentioned that we wanted to check if when are perturbations created or, or if they are created, no? if perturbations can be observed when this fluid moves around. So this will be at the beginning. As this <laughs> corresponds to the perturbative component at the beginning is, is constant, so we don't have it. And then we can see that as time pass, there is a, a change. So we can observe in the in the in the region, in the physical region, that there is a change in the density. So there will be uh, perturbations created. So this is one of the first things that we, we have checked so far. We also checked that there is an increase of the magnetic field. So at the beginning, we don't have any kind of uh, dy magnetic field. So as time passes, we can see now that there is an increase of the magnetic field, basically where there are all these perturbations and these and this currents, both in the py and bz. This, uh, this kind of um, increase in the magnetic field, we are studying if they will change, if we change, for example, some terms of the forcing, or if we change these small perturbations that we have. So we are still working, working on this. And one of the most important things that we want to take from the simulations uh, is, the, is the current. We want to take the value of this current to check if it's enough, well, to put it in the other part of the project that I will explain now, to check if this is enough to, when it dissipates, inflate the, the hot Jupiter. So basically here you have uh, the Z component and here you have the J squared, um, sorry, J power two uh, current at different times. Blue, is at the beginning of the simulation, orange 1,000 time cycles, um, green 200 and red 300. So basically at the beginning, what if we if we go into detail in, in, in smaller time, step, time steps, we can see that at the beginning, there are a lot of um, changes in the, in the current. That time, but as time passes, these changes are not as much marked because we have lower, a lower order of magnitude. At the beginning, they are around one, and as time passes, these um, these changes are around ten to the minus one. So basically, what is important is to infer with the order of magnitudes that these currents will have in the simulation to put these values in the in the other part of the question. 
So here, more or less, the, the currents have an order of magnitude to 10 to the minus one. I didn't mention this before, but all these magnitudes are dimensional. So we are not using, a, at the beginning of the, of the simulation, we, we change all the variables and we adapt all the variables in order to be dimensionally and then fixing some, uh, well, three, the temperature, the gravity, and the molecular mass of the, of the planet give uh, all, the, all the others. And then we have the other part of the project, which is the hot Jupiter population study. So the aim of this study is to check which models that we are creating fit the most with the observational data. So these models are models of the planetary evolution of the, of the hot Jupiters in one dimension. So we, we observe how the radii of these hot Jupiters change in time. So there are previous studies that, that explore some of these effects of the, of the deposition of heat in the, in the hot Jupiters, but we are improving these studies because we are using real, realistic uh, conductivity profiles. We are using um, magnetic field. We, we, we change the magnetic field. We, we, we look how it evolves uh thanks to the thanks to the sculling loads and we are comparing these models with the with the observations so as an observational for for the observations we have <coughs> yeah for the for the observations we check at the nasa uh, exoplanet archive so at the beginning we had 744 uh, jupiter like planets which had available data uh, in radius, equilibrium, temperature, and, and mass. And we were focused. Yeah, this is at the beginning. So then we focused uh, with those planets. We had masses from 0 0.1 to 13 Jupiter masses and with errors less than 25% in the, in the radius, which is the, the magnitude in which we are, we are interested. With this restriction, we had 601 Jupiter like planets left. And then we focus just on those which had masses <laughs> higher than 0 0.5 Jupiter masses because our models uh, just can explain evolutions uh, about this, this Jupiter mass, uh, this, this mass. And finally, um, taking into account that hot Jupiters have this proximity, so they have high temperatures, we impose that this Jupiter-like planet should have at least uh, 1,000 1, uh, Kelvin as a temperature actually. So, yeah, this is this is what we what we do in or what we did in order to select our data. And here is our final recopilation of the of all the exoplanets that we are considering as a yeah as a set to compare them with the uh, with the models. Okay, let's talk about the simulation. So Tanner is, is working on, on this simulation. So basically what we are using MESA. MESA is a stellar 1D evolution code that we have adapted for hot Jupiters. So basically this, um, this uh, code evolved the planetary structure for, for the practically the whole life of the of the of the planet. So as an input, we have the stellar irradiation. We can change the amount of the stellar irradiation that the planet receives. We are considering the two different kinds of, of omic uh, depositions, the atmospheric one and the internal one. So the internal one, we are using uh, a conductivity profile which has been studied in detail, which is the one in, in dots yeah. from Zabu and, and Collins. And, and then we are doing simulation for different initial masses of the, of the planet from different temperatures of the star and for different initial radius to check how they change in impact. So 
This is one of the preliminary results that we have. This is not the final one because we are still modifying some of the uh, omic, some of the conductivity profiles. But the idea is that here we have the age of the planet. Here we have the radius, so how it changed in, in time. And we have four different lines. The, yes, the lines with dots that corresponds to no heating. So this one will be a planet like Jupiter that is far from the star and has no omic, uh, no omic dissipation. The second one is with no joules. So it means that is a hot Jupiter, so a planet that has irradiation, but has no, has no dissipation. The third one will correspond to hot Jupiter, so high irradiation, but also omic dissipation at internal level. And the fourth, the same, irradiation, and omic dissipation at atmospheric level. So basically, what we can see at first sight is that if we compare models with no joule or no heating, with models that include this joule dissipation, the, the radi can achieve higher values. However, these values, in some cases, are not enough still to explain this inflated radi, but we are checking the, the omic, the omic well, the conductivity profiles. So as these are not um, final results, we cannot conclude anything. Um, you can you can see here different lines that are not marked. So these different lines correspond to different uh, effective temperatures from the from the start. So depending on the radiation, uh, we will have a, a different a different evolution. So when we have these models ready with the final with the final inputs and the final omic well omic no, uh, conductivity profiles defined, the the objective is to compare the simulations and the models and check which of these models fits the most with the observational data so far. So we are still thinking or debating how we will do this this comparison, but we I hope we will have the 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 results. So yeah, just to to finish regarding the MHC simulations, now we are finishing with this analysis of the results. Uh, we will include the spectra as a parameter to to check our our values. And uh, we will see how the different wind profile, the different wind profiles, the different perturbations, and and different resolution on the physical zone can affect on our simulation. Then, for future research, we will include also the viscosity, the thermal diffusivity, and the and the resistivity. Uh, this is for the MHD simulations and for the hot Jupiter population study. We are now trying to, to improve this, this omic heating profile with the, with the conductivity. And because as we saw, this, this conductivity depends on the temperature and we have to take into account different temperatures. So we are, we are working on it. And finally, we will compare the, the observational data with these final models that we will have. So, and just as, um, to let you know some of the things that should be done in, in hot Jupiters in, in general, not in, in omic dissipation, but in, in hot Jupiters. So we need more data, more studies to distinguish the difference between the different kind of, of formation channels, uh, the, different, the different channels that we mentioned before. Uh, the test mission will, will give us a lot of information about radial velocity, which can, um, give us information for some planetary systems such as WASP-47. Uh, um, then the Gaia mission will give us a lot of uh, new discoveries about hot Jupiter planets. And it will help us to, to answer some of the questions that 
that exists nowadays about the connection between hot Jupiters and, uh, and the occurrence on the on the hot star. Uh, regarding the structure and, and evolution, now we have this bias, for example, for hot Jupiters that they are easily detected. So there are a lot, no? but we know that as much as more planets will be detected, all these biases, we hope that they are they are they are not anymore. Um, and yeah, one of the most important things in in hot Jupiters is the James Webb telescope that will give a lot of information about atmospheric properties, so composition, circulation, scale. So these questions will be really important to to improve the um, the knowledge that we have nowadays in in hot Jupiters, but also in in exoplanets. Yeah. So these are the take home points basically. So that's that's all. Thank you. We're not starting to uh, such an interesting talk, so we have questions from the audience or online as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ali, for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, very exciting to see. I expect a lot of development anticipation for a long time, um, but it's good to see that people are going into it more carefully. Um, one thing I don't, it is a very general question, but at the end of the day, the energy that's come, that's stored in the wings of the hot Jupiter is coming from the star anyway. Yes. Right? So it's in the energy budget of the flux evaluation. So it looks like it, it's a bit just like putting more opacity or more absorbance into the atmosphere would make the same. Mm -hmm. um, I would naively say that we just make the, 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 the atmosphere effectively the same effect, right? So why, why then? Um, so what, where is this energy coming, extra energy that is pumping your planet is coming from? Because otherwise the, the, the plants that are heated just pumping out of the opacity of the atmosphere should show the same thing. Yeah, but, okay. From my understanding, um, the opacity is not enough. To, if you put this opacity, it's not enough to explain the radio of hot Jupiters that we see now. For the internal omic dissipation, it doesn't depend on the radiation of the exoplanet. And from the external, it's true. Let me go back. Yeah. Here. Yes. It's true that there is a dependence, a little dependence on the the, ra the radiation with the with the radino, but it's not enough. Yeah, but where, did, where is this energy coming from? The one that inflates the planet is in the winds. I understand that the energy from the wind is thermal energy also. Yes, but it's omic dissipation. So yeah, but the tools that come in come out. Yes, but let me think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, fine. <laughs> we have the um, the winds, the energy. Okay, the, the particles are moving, no? They are charged, and these particles dissipate the energy, and the energy, this energy that they dissipate is the one that will inflate the planet. Sure, yeah, but this energy is coming from somewhere. It's fine, we can discuss it. Um, okay. You have to move the winds, right? Like uh, the energy in the winds is coming from somewhere. It's, but it's a thermal process, it's a different in temperature. Sense. Yes, but it's because this wind profile that we have in the, we have like a shear layer, no? We have a wind profile and this will heat, will move the particles. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Or the people online as well? Uh, what? there? Um, thanks, Javier, for the talk. Um, you didn't mention anything about the uh, influence of the chemical composition of the planet, as I understand. Mm -hmm. What Jupiter's tend to happen on metal rich stars, so they're supposed to be very abundant in metals. So, is there any, you expect any effect from that? We are not studying the chemical composition. We are just studying it as a fluid, but with a fixed molecular uh, weight. But 
what what uh, chemical composition are you assuming for the uh, for the plant? Um, a hydrogen helium, I think. Then you need the metals as well. Right? Yes, because yes, the yes. Gas, but, but then, but are you assuming solar electricity or something? For the, you mean here for the global? Uh, for sorry. Right in your in your, in your model the, here. I understand that you have to assume some sort of chemical composition. In the boxes, we assume a fixed molecular weight that is uh, an average of of the composition of the of the plant. That's solar. And that's all. And Wait. That's that's the solar composition. For no. In terms of, is it you have hydrogen, helium, and then other. Yes. Other yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. But we have an, an average of all of them. We we are not. We have a molecular weight, which is the average of the proportion of all the components that we will have in the in the planet. I think we have time for one last quick question. <laughs> okay, so if there are no other questions. Uh, let's uh, thank Claudia again. Um, okay, I'm going to go.